Hey, Buds, welcome back for another incredible episode of Weird Buzz Radio. And of course, I'm your host, Rai. And joining me today is a guest that we've had on before and one that I'm really excited to share with you all today because, as you know, we have been on a journey in our own cannabis retail world of Buds Emporium here in Medway, Maine. And when you're opening a retail store, there's a lot you need to think about and just so much going on, so much chaos. And one of the biggest things that you need to figure out is what are you going to use for your POS system? And we have spoken about different companies. We've spoken to Gary before, and we've learned a little bit about Kova. And so when we were getting open, uh, we called Gary and Gary introduced us to his team at Kova Software, and they took incredible care of us. They taught us how to use this entire system in a very tight timeline. Uh, you know, we were kind of under the gun. We were just moving slow and then move fast. And Gary's team was there the entire step of the way. Even when we were delayed, uh, you know, they were still there and they were still ready to help us. And we get the system in and it's perfect. And we have ATMs in and that's helping us with our business and our tourists. And then the ATMs go away because their banks say no more. We saw where it's located. So we got a, a, a debit card system and The fees are insane. And when you're already paying incredible taxes, you cannot afford incredible fees. So what do I do in a panic? I think, well, who has solutions to these things? Well, of course, our next guest, Gary Cohen, CEO of Kova Software, always has solutions to these types of things. So Gary, welcome back to Weed Buds. Hey, thanks, Rai. It's great to be here. It's incredible to think that our journey started prior to the pandemic, and we met, you're one of our first episodes of our rebranded Weed Buds radio show. We met at MJ BizCon, and we've stayed in touch ever since. We've seen you in Portland, Maine. We purchase and we invest in your product, and we love it so much, and it's just been a wild ride, and it hasn't been that long. Well, in marijuana years, three years is like 30 in any other industry. So time flies fast, especially in a super high growth space like we're in. Speaking of super high growth, I remember a story that you shared with us at BizCon about how you kind of your first trade show, if you will, and kind of where your market share was and how it grew. And as far as I know, Kova is now the number one POS software in in North America. I mean, such a lion's share of the U.S. and the Canadian market. Yeah, we are. Well, I think that, um, you know, your experience with us, and and just so that the people listening know, I I love Rye, and I want to support him, but we didn't do anything special or different for him. So when he reached out and said, hey, I need to get going with something for my dispensary that I'm finally going to get to to open. Um, you didn't get, I, uh, I hate to say it, but you didn't get any special treatment. You got like what everyone gets. So everybody I, can get the Rye Russell treatment from Cova. That's right. That Rye Russell treatment is, is <laughs> um, it's a top shelf experience. 100%. But I think that's our, that's our secret sauce. So I think what we did really astutely or well at the very beginning was, you know, we were new to the industry. Everyone we're dealing, for the most part, everyone is new to the industry. When I think about everyone opening a dispensary, we've got a lot of people who have no retail background. Almost, I'd say 90% have no cannabis background. And then you, you add that whole compliance element into it where you got to do it right, you know, and get connected up and report properly, do the taxes properly and all that stuff. And it's complicated. And we set a mission to simplify that complexity and hold your hand during the process. So not just teach you how to use the software, but, but try to educate you on here's what you're getting into. 
here are the pitfalls, here's how you can navigate through those things. And if we could, you know, if we could be that value added service, not just the software, but a partner to help you through this, um, that's, that was our mission. And when people ask, like, you know, how'd you do, how did Kova go on such a fast trajectory? Because we were, of the bigger POS companies, we're the last ones in. But we went to the top pretty fast. And it was those two things, compliance and education. There's our secret sauce. And that's free for everybody. Uh, but the execution is, is really where it lies. Well, and I think the, uh, the execution side really comes about because of our DNA. We spun out of a big, huge POS company. So the know-how of how, you know, I guess one of my proudest moments is we got this client in Canada that was an existing chain that had 20 dispensaries in Ontario. And didn't go with Cova originally, decided they wanted to go with us. But could we, could we launch all 20 of their stores by the end of the month? So we'll sign the thing, but in the next 25 days, can we cut over 20 stores? And we did 20 stores perfectly. Well, what's behind all that is, you know, I hate to say it, it's the non-sexy do you have processes? Do you have people trained internally who know how to do this stuff um, in scale? Do it at an enterprise level as, you know, as fast and, as, and all the parts necessary have been figured out and everyone can get on the same page. So, you know, that's, that's how you execute through experience, docu you know, document what works, what doesn't work. Cove has been incredibly nimble since day one in self-analyzing. What are we doing? Now, that, that's not working or that's not the best way. Um, and, and not being stuck in, that's the other good thing. We're new, the industry's new. So instead of saying, well, that's how we've always done it. There is no, that's how we've, there is no always. So what, the way we're doing it isn't that good or it's not that effective. Change it, modify it, test it. Does it work better? There's the, the story of execution. Well, when I think about the way that I was, that Rye Russell treatment that I got, right? It was, I felt like I was just obsessed with you know i felt you know like just everybody just took such good care of you well and you know I, what's well you know what's underneath that not to cut you off but, yeah. but one of those things that happened was we started looking at every dispensary or set of dispensaries or chain of dispensaries as a project and i'm not a i'm not a um, process guy but there's a whole discipline in the world called project management. And there's a proper way to manage a project, whether you're building a house or remodeling a kitchen or, or building a road or designing software. It's a project. And there's a way to define what you're trying to do, assign people responsibilities, go through a set of steps, and when you think about you being obsessed on that's the project, right? Your, your store was a project and there's all kinds of people who got assigned to your project and they are obsessed on it. That's, that's their thing. And they know what they're supposed to do relative to your timeline, store size, way that you want to operate the store. So anyhow, I'm giving you all the secret sauce, but it is, it's, but it's not as it's, it, it's not like we're geniuses. These are just taking the things that work that are generally accepted ways of the optimal way to do business or do a piece of business and applying it to our industry, which is brand new. And guess what? Most of the other players in my industry, in our industry, 
they're not on that page yet. They will be someday. But we kind of came into this going, well, there's project management discipline. How are we going to put that in? And I've always been obsessed with the consumer because that's ultimately what my side of the supply chain is focused on. However, I was really inspired by the level of service and care from your team. And I mean, just to your point, they were foreshadowing where I was and helping me be prepared for something that I did not even know that I needed to be prepared for. And that is something that we really try to tailor that experience uh, for our guests as well. You know, maybe a 5% off concentrate is stupid. You know, we don't know our customer. You know, this customer only smokes flour. And that's what I felt like with your team is they really got to know me and kind of tailored that experience. And maybe I didn't take some of the generally accepted best practices. I was like, I don't want to do it that way. And your team would be like, okay, well, how do you want to do it? And how can we make it fit? So it's streamlined within the way you will execute. So it was just incredible. And obviously, as we got going and we learned more, it was the right fit for us. But one of the questions that came up for us was like, you know, you hear about metric and seed to sale tracking and you're worried about compliance and all of this stuff. And it just, there's so many point of sale systems out there that it was hard to kind of tell, like, do I need seed to sale software? Do I need retail POS software? I mean, is, is there a different, can you help kind of break that down for other people that might've kind of been on that journey? Like I was like, what's the difference and you know, what does a retailer really need? Uh, That's a, that's a great question. You know, what you just asked, has has become a marketing induced complexity in terminology so when i started COVID, seed to sale and traceability were a synonymous concept it was when you plant a seed gets big enough how are we going to track that seed as it becomes a plant all the way through the supply chain to when the chain of custody gets handed over to the end user, the customer. And it's a chain of custody thing. This whole concept of traceability and seed to sale is because A, you know, states like your state that went medicinal, it's a medicine. So can we implement some of the, the process and thinking around tracking medicine? What happens if a medicine is tainted or bad or, you know, we, we got to go catch, catch it, get it out of the supply chain or get it out of the hands of the person who bought it, kind of like tainted Tylenol. And when you think about the, a box of Tylenol and it's got the lot number, expiration date, it's got all kinds of stuff stamped into that bottle, that's so that if something's bad, we know exactly which batch to go find, get off the shelves, and protect people. So that's traceability. Now, the second benefit to traceability is you've got something that's federally illegal. So from the state perspective, to be able to say to the federal government, hey, we're watching this marijuana from when it's planted, all the way through the supply chain. We're going to track it so that it doesn't divert. That's a big concept is diversion. So that the legal cannabis doesn't divert out of the supply chain, get sold out the back door or stolen. Or inbound diversion, we're going to get illegal or unlicensed product or untested product into the supply chain. So we're going to put in this whole traceability system. And that way, if I go into a store and I go, this product, this product's not licensed or this product was never tested, I can trace it all back and go, I know what's kosher and not in the store. Well, where everything got confusing is when people, some of my competitors started saying, we sell seed to sale software. Because originally, seed to sale was the state traceability systems, which was either BioTracker metric, 
And then for a brief period, Leaf Data Systems was in it. But those were traceability and traceability was seed to sale. And it was a state implemented system. But then they switched it over to vertical software. And instead of calling their product vertically integrated software, meaning it manage, it's software that can help you manage and, and tra track your row or your MIP, your manufacturing operation, or your retail, and they're vertically integrated. You have a vertically integrated business that does all of those aspects of the supply chain. And our software is vertically integrated to, to connect internally on our side, the software side, with all those pieces. And they started calling it seed to sale. And that's what made everything confusing. The truth is there's grow management software. There's manufacturing software where you're taking raw products and you're turning them into some sort of other product. And then there's retail software. Now, I'll say this one thing. It's very rare in any in industry that someone does all of the pieces of the supply chain well. Usually, if you're a farmer, there's great agricultural software to help me understand what goes into my, my crop and my product. And the, the mechanics of that, that are tracking yields, you know, what are we putting in and what are we getting out and how, what's working and what's not, that's grow management software. Manufacturing software, it's like whether you're a Coke plant or a cookie, cookie bakery, or uh, you're making razor blades. There's manufacturing is a process and you're measuring and managing the process. And there's great software for that. And then lastly, there's retail software that's all about running a store. It's very rare that any company does all of that great. Lastly, in our industry, because of metric or because of state traceability systems, it doesn't matter whether you have a software that can do all three of those things. At every stage of the product's life, it has to be reported to the state through that state traceability system. So there's no states where I have to, I can bypass that and within my software, I can make it, transfer it to my store and, I, and I'm done. And I can keep everything within my software platform and it'll see and talk to each other because the validation step that's got to happen in every state is here's the plant that I planted. Here's how big it got. Now I've harvested. I got to tell the state what I've harvested. And then I got to tell the state, where's it going? Even if it's going to my own store, I can't just move it in my software. I have to go to the state. The state transfers it to the next place in the supply chain. And I think that the misnomer about one software can do it all, it, it doesn't work that way. And, it, and the benefit you get is minimal, if anything. One last thing, and I know I'm throwing arrows at some of my competitors, but I'm going to throw them anyway. Mm -hmm. And that is, when I ask people, what's the best advantage you get out of seed to sale software, as they call it, the number one answer is single sign-on. I just have one login and password. I don't have to remember three. Well, in the grand scheme of things, I know that's a convenient thing, but I don't know if that justifies the hundreds or thousands of dollars a month. But anyhow, so my recommendation is always Go out, look for best in breed. For If you've got to grow, there's amazing grow management that is software that is as easy and sophisticated to use as COVID. Same for manufacturing. And then that's what we do in the retail. And similarly, on the payment side, there are many 
competitors and there are many advertised claims, if you will, and it gets murky, you know, what, you know, some offer part of a fee and some of that fee goes to the retailer and that kind of incentivizes them to go there. Uh, some just have exorbitant fees on the consumer, no fees on the retailer. And then there's others where there's fees on everybody and it just gets, you know, so confusing. And I think we reviewed probably four or five. There aren't too, too many, but there are a handful of payment solutions out there because as I mentioned, our ATMs just no longer became an option for us. And so we looked at, you know, we had to act quick and we got a system in and it was working, but then it was declining all of our Canadian customers. And, you know, for us, that's a big market for us right here on the Canadian border. And so that was a surprise. And we kind of got through that and moved through that hurdle. And then I started seeing the daily fees I was paying. And I was like, man, you know, I'm already paying all of these other taxes and I'm already paying, you know, these fees at just... Oh, and, you know, yes, it's cheaper than the ATMs for the consumer, but it's not necessarily a better all around product. And then, you know, I, I, I'm talking to Nick and I'm asking some of your team, like, there's got to be a solution. A day later, I get an email, there's Cova pay, and I'm all excited. And uh, I met with your team. And I don't know if I was uh, the first person to reply, but I'd say as soon as that You're email one of the came, first. Yeah, I uh, I was right on that email. And uh, s- same thing, you know, this, your entire team is knowledgeable. They explained it to me, how it's going to impact my consumer, which is the number one. Uh, number two was the fees. And number three was, can my simpleton brain make it work? Uh, if it matches that criteria, then we're, then we're pretty solid. And it did. It was a better product for the consumer. It's way more cost effective for us and the lines of communication are there. I know that when I provide feedback, it it goes up, it goes all the way up until it gets to you if it needs to. Um, but your team's so educated that I'm sure most of the time it doesn't even need to. And so I think within 72 hours, we had a plan, like an execution plan together of how we we're going to pull this off. And so that alone stands out. But I'd love for you to just kind of give a, a brief synopsis, if you will, of what Cova Pay is uh, and what the advantages are for retailers. Well, I don't know if this is a good story or a bad story. (laughs) You know, since we launched, which will be five years in November, I've literally gotten three calls a week, every single week, from some payment provider wanting to partner with Cova. Because when you're connected to the POS, it's the holy grail. You know, um, And it's whether it's a fully integrated solution or it's a standalone solution. One way or another, payment and POS in other industries was the, uh, like an inflection, like an inflection in technology and and, uh, customer experience, um, everything. Everything kind of gelled when payments and POS got married. So everyone was contacting us. And, uh, and honestly, our board and our, the company we spun out with is so skittish about risk. Like they don't want anything bad to happen to COVA and they don't want anything bad. And we don't want anything bad to happen to our customers. So as a result, we were incredibly slow in getting um, an integrated payment solution. And we were incredibly slow at even getting a non-integrated payment solution. And a non-integrated payment solution, it's like when you go to a restaurant or, a, or, or Jiffy Lube or something, and they say it's going to be $114. How are you going to pay? I'm going to pay with a credit card. You give them their credit card. They type in $114 in a separate little payment terminal. 
and then they swipe your card. Well, if it's that kind of experience, they're not, if they have to type in the amount from the purchase of the purchase, it's not integrated. They're, they call it a swivel chair because you're doing this system and then you do that system. And you come back to the system and finish it. So it took us over two years to get U.S. a vetted payment solution that was a swivel chair. And the reason that we were so slow, and there were other, there's companies in our space that have been doing payments for years and years. But to find one that, that was relatively safe, that they had FinCEN certification, which is a, an element of banking accreditation, is very rare. And you go, well, Gary, how'd you have like hundreds call you? Well, because they're, they're, not, they're, <laughs> they're not legit for cannabis. So the, the U.S. banking system will not bank the cannabis industry because Visa and MasterCard are um, federal banks. And if it's federally illegal, they won't touch it. So then all these other guys are just masking who the customer is or like I, I could tell you the funniest, like I, I've got a hundred stories of a guy going, wait, just talk to me because we figured it out. We know because of the, the Spanish Falkland Island Act of 1435, you can actually run payments through the Falklands on this international treaty that is totally legit. <laughs> I'm just looking at him like, that's the biggest bunch of bullshit I've ever heard. This is the definition of money laundering. I was going to say, yes. That's all this is. Then you get the next guy who's saying, oh, no, we figured it out. We convert the payment to crypto. We process the crypto through London. They turn it back into cash. It gets back in your bank account in seven to 10 days. That's money laundering. You've, t- you've diverted money into another form to pull it back into usable Um, currency and you can't do it so then you ask well gary why don't you just do it all your competitors are doing it and then dispensaries you know guys come to you ryan and go hey we'll do your payment processing they probably hit you up a couple times a week um, because you're a brand every day new retailer and how are we going to do it how are you going to get away with it oh we've got it figured out they all say the same thing well, we wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And I can tell you it cost us opportunity because um, if someone else is going to do it, some other POS company is going to do it, and it's what we want. Um, so we were, we were just cautious. So when we finally found people that, Oh, wait. Oh, well, I, where I was going was, what's the cost? Like, so what's the big deal? Are you going to go to jail? No, nobody's going to go to jail if you use Jim's credit card process. But what's going to happen is, in the time it takes to clear your funds, so if, if your dispensary does 50 transactions a day, and let's say half of them are, are on a debit or credit, and so 25 transactions at an average of $70. So I don't know what that comes out to. Let's say it's a couple thousand dollars a day. Over the course of a week, that's $14,000. That your money is somewhere in processing. Well, once they find out that you're a dispensary, and in the layers of credit card processing, someone discovers it and says, pull the plug. Um. You don't you don't get the fourteen thousand. You'll never that see that money. Us. Well, and most dispensaries, like it would crush anyone who is budgeted and planned on that money, and, and, and the money goes away. Then the next the next guy that you switch to happens again, and the lifespan before the plug gets pulled is usually about two and a half to three months. So if four times a year you're losing fourteen to fifteen thousand. What is sixty thousand a year significant? 
Probably so. So that's why we didn't do it. Well, let's go to Covapay. So what Covapay is, is it's debit. It's, it's not credit, but we found it, you know, we've got um, a provider that is legally sanctioned to do debit only, uh, long track record, you know, so we found a partner that, um, that it's, it's safe, like it's safe for us, which means it's safe for our clients. And we've done the work to integrate it. And the big difference so, you know, when you think about the customer experience, swiping, like entering the amount swiping versus your total is $114. We will take debit or cash. And they go debit. Sure, give me your card. We swipe it, done. It's not that much time. The difference is, is in reconciliation. So at the end of the day, we sold 1000 700 of it was cash, 300 was debit. And in the POS in COVA, as you process it, you hit cash or debit. So we know what it should have been. But then when you pull the tape off of your credit card or debit card readers, it says um, $250. So now we got to find which one of the sales adds up to the $50. What if it was a 30 and a 20? Somehow, some manager every night's got to figure out how to reconcile the money. In an integrated solution, the fact that it got swiped, it's debit. So no one has to go, which button do I push to try to keep account? So that's a long way of saying um, it's, it's good from that, that um, the way you manage your store every day. It's even better in your records and reporting because now at the end of the month, I can pull a report. It tells me exactly what my cash sales were, debit sales. If um, there's any problems, all the records are all associated a payment type with what was sold. Um, and I think, I think the most, now here's one last thing. Everyone always, you know, how did COVID get so big and we didn't have a payment solution? Well, one of the things in a market like Maine is you've educated the market. Show up with cash. Or if you don't have cash, we have an ATM. So 90% of dispensaries have, an, have or had an ATM. The ATMs are actually going away at a, at a faster and faster rate now. But you could go over there and get cash. Get out of line. We'll hold your sale. Go get some money out. But we've trained people. This is how it works. Now, tourists don't know. That's who pulls out a credit card. It's all I got. But the percentage of Americans that have a debit card is, is something like in the 80 percentile. And the ones with a credit card are in the 60 percentile. So more people have debit than they have credit. And uh, the average per transaction is almost uh, 15 to 20% higher um, when I can just keep adding things to the basket. I have to worry. I only took 60 out of the ATM. I'm not going to go back, pay another fee, and take another $30 to get more. So they just keep adding to the basket. We've had so many times where people are like, oh, man, I only have 40 bucks. Do you take card? And we'll say, well, we take a debit card. Oh, can I grab that, that, and that? Exactly. So it's, it's good for everybody. It's good for the customer. It's good for you. And the whole COVID pay thing, um, I think what we're going to want, what you'll wind up seeing strategically is, as it grows and gains more and more adoption, the uh, it'll offset um, all the all kinds of other fees, so subscription fees, CRM and loyalty, e-commerce. That's the other thing. We'll be adding the U.S. Um, e-commerce component, so you can just pay on. You know, you could you could pay, um, you could pay online. That's kind of cool too. That's amazing. 
So one of the things that we're preparing for, Gary, and I know Brooke would be mad if I didn't ask you, uh, is that as we continue to grow our retail business, the state of Maine is looking at delivery for adult use. And it's something that we're looking at very closely. And I'm just curious, you obviously you have a lot of wisdom about different markets. Uh, I was wondering if you had any insights on, you know, how does delivery impact a retail business? And will these solutions be able to be integrated uh, once delivery is available? The answer is yes, they all will be. Uh, COVID is partnered now with delivery software. So we have a really great partner in a company called WebJoint. And to answer your, your question at a bigger level, as a market matures, delivery will become more and more of a, of a thing. And the reason is at the early stages of a market, customers don't know the form factors that they can consume cannabis. They don't know which, you know, which types they want. Like, am I a sativa guy? Am I, am I hybrid? They, they don't know all that stuff. And that education that you do in the store is not only vital to them, but it helps build that trust and it helps build your store. All of that is, it, it's necessary and it's vital to both sides. So a retail store at the start of a cannabis market is one of the greatest things and necessary things to get the industry off the ground. But over time, people figure out, this is what I like. Like, I'm a this kind of guy. Here's how I like to consume it. I don't really need help anymore. I, I, I know what I want. Well, the next phase is order ahead, order online, pick up in store. So I, I don't really hand-holding. I'm just going to, can I go online? Can I order it? Can I call you? We you set it aside? I'll come in. And then the next step is delivery. I don't, I don't need to even go to the store. Now you're providing that convenience factor. I think delivery, again, in our industry, it's a patchwork of states. No two states are alike. The regs are different in every single state. And the delivery regs are even more um, convoluted because of their, you know, hyperness to, to security, to when you think about that seed to sale, well, what's going on between the retail store and the end point? Should we be tracking it? Where is the marijuana? Like that was the whole point of traceability. Where's right. the pot at all times? Well, is the pot driving by a junior high stopping? It's kind of, it's kind of scary. So, we, you know, some states want to know, the like, does your software set a route? And then does your software have GPS tracking to make sure they followed the route? They didn't deviate? Does your software say they deviated? And they actually went to the strip bar that they shouldn't have gone to. Chances are the guy's selling a bunch out of the back of the delivery car. And then he went back on his route. Like that's the, every state's different of how much do we want to watch? Every state's different about um, what type of vehicle can be used. Can it be a private vehicle? Does it have to be a certain type of vehicle where like in uh, Missouri, the driver cannot be able to access the storage of the cannabis, which needs to be in a locked, um, in a locked box or a safe in the vehicle, but he can't get to it from the driver's seat. He's got to get out, go around. So it's almost a van or some sort of delivery vehicle. Then you've got the issue of insurance. Oh. Who's going to insure it? How much do we have to insure it for? And uh, it adds all kinds of overhead. The worst state, Missouri, when they wrote up the original delivery guidelines, they had two cars for every delivery. 
They had a car with the cannabis and a security car following. And you talk about like the dumbest thing you've ever heard. And the good news was enough voices jumped in and went, no, no, nobody does that. You can't do that. It just kills the whole, you know, and they were trying to deliver medicine to people who couldn't come and get their medicine. Right. So the intent was there. The execution on a, on a realistic basis was just ridiculous. So delivery, in my opinion, delivery will be part of the industry in every state in the next two, three years. Um, and it makes sense. It's a win-win for everybody. The thing is, if your state over-regulates it, you know, you need to charge 20 bucks on top of whatever you're doing for a delivery fee. And now you're pricing it out for people who, who don't have a car, can't get to the, to the store. So there's nuances to it, but it's, it's coming. Amazing. Well, Gary, I'm so excited to get to connect with you again and catch up. I feel like we do this once a year, so we're going to need to do it more often. I just appreciate the time we get together. Well, me too. And, and honestly, my time going to Maine was the greatest. Like I, I couldn't Amazing. be more of a Maine fan. And, um, and I haven't been there in a year. Like I got to get back. Absolutely. Come back. Yeah, I will tell you right now for Maine, it is hot as it can get. I think we've had a couple of uh, mid or low 90 degree days. So I know for you, you've experienced that. But up here in the Northeast, you don't get that too often. But another month or so, and we'll have to bring you north of Portland to where we are next time. The lakes and the mountains, Gary. I can't wait. Well, Ryan, it's great to see you. It's great to see you, and it's great to see all of you tuned in to Weed Buds Radio. Be sure to head over to WeedBudsRadio.com. Check out those show notes, links to connect with Gary and Kova Pay. And, of course, we'll see you in the next episode.